So let's get started. Uh, so I'll start with talking high level about how the process of solving this problem work over time. So as a lot of love stories these days, this one started on social media by a post on a group about math problems that I really like. So in 2020, uh, some guy, Dylan, uh, posted a problem that apparently he came up with and it says uh, the following, um, we want to fill the grid of, uh, with positive integers such that every uh, pair of occurrences of an integer is at some distance depending on the integer uh, where the, integer, the distance is in the taxi cap metric and we want to figure out how many colors do we need for that. I'm being purposely big on the problem. Uh, I'm just trying to say that this problem appeared on Facebook. I thought people were gonna uh, solve it kind of immediately uh, but actually I waited and nobody uh, really solved it. Um, so I started trying uh, by hand and I tried for an entire year to solve this by hand without success. And then I came to Carnegie Mellon in 2021 where I saw that Professor Marianne Hurley uh, was, had been doing work on coloring problems with SAT solvers and my first reaction seeing his uh, talk on that at the uh, open house was uh, to tell him about my problem and see if his techniques could somehow be of help. He agreed to uh, work with me on that and we started working. In the first year we made uh, quite a lot of progress and we ended up uh, figuring out that the answer to this coloring number uh, was a number between 13 and 15. Inclusive. But, what's right? Inclusive. Inclusives, <laughs> yes, that's a great point, yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, we realized after a year uh, that first of all, uh, the problem was known uh, since 2002, uh, even though this person might have originally discovered it, but it was a known thing. And actually, the bounds between 13 and 15 were already known by people. That was the state of the art of the problem. So we had gotten there by our own means, and we were pretty excited. Uh, so we kept working, and after a year of grinding on it, we uh, ruled out 13 as a possible answer. So now the answer was uh, between 14 and 15. Sorry. <clears throat> I didn't understand the problem still. Yes. Also, I don't know what the taxi cab metric is. Right. Uh, so it's also known as the uh, Manhattan distance. I know that one. Okay, it's the same one, yes. Okay. This, this was just the wording of this person. Uh, yes. I, I, I actually don't really like the way he worded the problem. Um, so what was the? Yeah, so I'll, I'll get into the details of the problem uh, in a minute. You're going to explain the problem again. Yes, and, and in much better detail, because uh, there's quite a reformulation what, in my opinion, has to do in order to see why the problem makes a lot of sense. Also, what's the title of your talk? Um, it's, it's not, I have to write that down on this form. Yes, that's a, that's a good question. Can I tell you at the end? Because okay. I don't remember the exact name. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, you can, you, can, you can take that one. Um, okay, so we, uh, we rule out 13 as an answer. And even in another further year of progress, we uh, finally proved that 14 uh, was not possible either. So this led to uh, a quantum article about this uh, sort of 20 year long uh, odyssey, but more importantly, uh, and this is the thing, I wanna share with you all today is uh, the love story between SAT solving and mathematics. So my point here is to try to convince you that if you think of the TCS toolkit that uh, Ryan is kind of famous for, uh, I think SAT solving can be a jackhammer that you could add here. So now I'll give a very brief outline of the talk. So I'll explain some basics of SAT solving for folks I'm familiar with the techniques, then I'll briefly talk to some applications to math that hopefully can inspire further conversation with people here. Uh, hopefully it matches somebody's research as well. And then I'll uh, go into uh, the actual problem we solve, which is uh, the packing chromatic number of uh, Z2, the integer grid. So let's start from the very basics. Uh, set solving or satisfiability problems in general are about simultaneously solving, satisfying, sorry, uh, a set of constraints. So for an example, uh, imagine you're trying to schedule your semester and there are some constraints coming from the system, like for example, you cannot take those two classes on the same semester. 
Or for example, if you're taking uh, some class, then you need to be taking one or of two other classes in parallel, or uh, a class that's just not offered this semester. So then you wanna model uh, how could you take classes for this semester, and the way we will be thinking about Boolean formulas is in this colossal normal form where we present a conjunction, uh, so a logical and of these junctions, that is uh, logical ors. Now I'll re-index variables from one just to make things uh, slightly easier. And now if we consider an assignment of the variable, so saying uh, whether a variable is true or false or in the semantics of our problem, whether you're taking or not such and such class, then we can check that this assignment does not satisfy uh, the constraints we wanted, to we wanted it to satisfy. On the other hand, if we look at this assignment, then we will simply go one by one through the constraints, check that each of them is satisfied, and that will uh, mean that this is a satisfying assignment. It satisfies our set of constraints, and because there exists such an assignment, we'll say that our formula or our set of constraints itself is satisfiable. So let's jump into uh, an example of how any of this could be useful for first a little puzzle and then we will get into some more serious math. Uh, so consider a Sudoku puzzle like that, that we wanna solve with this framework. So uh, our variables will now represent whether in position ij of this Sudoku grid, you put number n. And now we need to impose some uh, constraints on the problem. So we wanna say that each cell of the grid will get some number, uh, which we can do just by adding such clauses. We need to respect the given clues. So if the clue is saying, for example, that in position one, one indexed from uh, the top left corner, there's a five, then that needs to be true. Uh, in position two, one, there needs to be a six, and so on. So we can enforce each of these uh, clues as a constraint. And then uh, here's where the interesting part starts. So Sudoku's are defined by some rules that forbid you to having, let's say, two occurrences of number three in the same row, or three occurrences of number seven in the same subgrid. So let's see how uh, that looks like uh, more concretely. Um, oh. Okay, I, I think this has to do with the projector issue. So, okay, I'll actually leave this for the end of the talk, but I, I, I wanna show at the very end of the talk how easy it is to code this with modern libraries. So by that I mean that basically the code you write in let's say Python, for example, it's basically the exact same as the thing on the slides. You, there's methods for adding variables, met methods for saying at most one of these variables is true and so on. So I'll, uh, Skip this demo because I think I cannot do it at the same time as the slides. Um, so now uh, let's jump straight into why uh, this idea of encoding things can be interesting even for Sudokus. Yes. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but could you go back a second? Can I see the encoding again for the? Is that supposed to represent the complete encoding of this game? So. No, there's a third one that, oops, I think appeared earlier and now for some reason it's not appearing. Um, but there's a third one which is about the, uh, the constraints of how in each row, column, and subgrid you need to have exactly one of the numbers. So it's basically like a notion of a number in each uh, cell, right? Uh, not necessarily, necessarily, right? Or, or at least you don't really care. So if you, if you uh, solve the Sudoku and your solution includes superposing like a seven and a three in the same position without violating any of the constraints, that usually would be fine. In the case of Sudoku, it's not possible, but this is very common in, coloring, in graph coloring problems. So it's implied by the... Yes, but even if it's not implied... Automatically by the fact that there are nine, only nine numbers allowed. Right, but even if it wasn't, like in the case of graph coloring, for example, you usually will not forbid a vertex for getting two colors, because if a vertex can be both red and blue without uh, violating any constraints, then that's totally fine for you. So uh, let me talk a little bit about how one encodes this idea of exactly one number in this row, column, or subgrid uh, will take, let's say, digit seven. So how do, so at least saying that at least one of these variables, uh, at least one of these numbers, let's say, takes digit seven, that's very easy. It's just an or between 
uh, x i j seven for each of the i j's you care about. The part that's tricky is how do you say that at most one of them is true. So the naive idea would be to create variables saying that they cannot both be simultaneously true for every pair i j. This is pretty bad in the sense that it uses O of n square many clauses. This will not make a huge impact on a nine by nine Sudoku, but if you think of generalized Sudoku, for example, you can solve much larger if you do better in this step. So it turns out that by uh, adding new variables to the problem, we can do substantially better and only use a linear number of clauses. So this is convenient in integer programming, what you're saying, doing integer programming. Probably. So it's similar to integer programming, but but there's a price you pay from going from Boolean, so there's a price you pay from going from Boolean um, satisfiability to integer programming. In particular, for example, in integer programming, you can say something like this weighted sum of my variables is smaller than a threshold. You can do that same with sad, but paying an exponential number of, uh, of clauses in the worst case sometimes. So there is a, there is a price you pay for uh, for converting like an integer linear program into a propositional one. And now if you think of the other direction, yes, you can always write this trivially as an integer linear program, but it will be much slower because an ILP is way, way slower than a SAT solver. Yes? Can you write like objective maximization? So there is a variant of SAT that's called MaxSAT where you can do that. And the traditional way of doing that, it's uh, minimizing the weighted sum of unsatisfied clauses. So to each clause, you assign a weight of how much you care about that restriction and then you will uh, minimize the unsatisfied weight. So yes, uh, in this talk I'll just be talking about uh, sort of direct satisfiability, but there's a whole world for MaxSat. So how can we do this with a linear number of clauses? So the main idea is to introduce uh, some sort of coordination variables here. So I'm using the abbreviation AMO for at most one, and the idea here is that um, the idea here is that um, I add this new variable y1, and I will say that at most one between x1, x2, x3, and y1 is true, and I'm at most one of the negation of y1 and the rest of the variables is true. So let's stop for a second and think about why does this work. So suppose, for example, x2 is true. If x2 is true, and I assume by inductive hypothesis that my encoding for smaller number of variables is correct, then the first part of the encoding will force y1 to be false. But because y1 is false, then the negation of y1 is true. And that implies that nobody on the other side can be true. So I'm coordinating, coordinating, my, coordinating my variables by introducing these y variables. And I will only introduce a linear number of them. So uh, if we do this recursively and stop when things are sufficiently small to not warrant a new variable, give me a minute. Uh, then we get that the number of clauses satisfies uh, a trivial recurrence relation that gives you that the number both of clauses and new variables is linear. Now, um, some, something that the uh, CS mind, trained CS mind, will think of immediately, it's like, well, why are you doing this splitting in terms of like chunks of three and then the rest as opposed to a balanced binary tree, right? Uh, it turns out, and this is, Part of why it's that solving it's both about like the sort of the mathematical understanding of asymptotics and doing things that are asymptotically faster mixed with some engineering and practical concerns. So it turns out that doing the binary tree split works significantly worse in practice. So this is a plot of the number of variables uh, you use uh, in blue with the binary tree split and in red with the chunks of three uh, splitting uh, idea, so they're asymptotically uh, the same, and they match every uh, power of two minus one, but, um, but the, uh, the chunks of three idea uh, always uses fewer or the same number of variables, and even more important, this is uh, some experimentation I made for this talk, the uh, runtime uh, is absolutely uh, terrible if you do the quadratic encoding, but then you also get substantial improvements from the binary tree version to uh, chunking of three, sometimes uh, constant factors, yes. What kinds of results do you get with different chunk sizes? Uh, like if you use like chunks of four, five, uh, so the one that minimizes the number of clauses plus auxiliary variables is with three. Uh, now, uh, 
part of the idea I'm mentioning now is that that actually doesn't mean that, it, that uh, in some particular problems it could be best to actually split with a larger number of variables. Yeah, uh, because things are problem dependent. Um, now, if you're prototyping things fast, you basically want your library to have a primitive where you do something like exactly one. And behind the scenes, this is happening, right? So it's unclear if you want super fine grain control of how to do splits. Yes, sorry, so th this is a big table to, um, so it's number of variables, number of clauses, uh, the time, and this is the size of the proof. So uh, when SAT solvers uh, prove a fact, prove that a formula is unsatisfiable, uh, they emit a certificate. I'm not gonna be talking much about the uh, certification in this talk, but they emit a proof, and hopefully, uh, or better encodings often lead to shorter proofs, which is the case here as well. Ah, yeah, uh, I'll, okay, I, I think I'll, I'll keep moving, but uh, think, think about the following. When you do the split, you're not staying on one of the sub-branches of the tree. You have to do both all the way. So you will like do one, uh, one class and variable per node of the tree. Um, so yes, the depth will be logarithmic, but the number of nodes total will be linear. And we can talk about more, more about it later, yes. So what's the difference between three chunks and three chunk five? Um, so something so subtle as whether you put the variable at the end of, or at the beginning of the class matters. So three chunks i is the one where you, the new auxiliary variables, you put it at the beginning or at the end. And this has to do with the fact that SAT solvers are implementing some concrete algorithm whose runtime has a worst case bound in theory, but in practice, all these little things about variable ordering, shuffling of clauses matter. Now, uh, set solving has been successful in a variety of math problems. Uh, it was used to solve a case of the Boolean Erdős discrepancy uh, conjecture uh, used by my advisor to solve the Boolean Pythagorean triples problem. Uh, sure number five, a number in Ramsey theorem was obtained through set solvers. Uh, Keller's conjecture, uh, John Mackey, one of the authors is right here with us, was solved with SAT solvers. Uh, and uh, the focus of my talk, the packing chromatic number of C2, and one that's very exciting is that uh, Marine Hulley just solved the minimum number of points in the plane to guarantee a convex empty hexagon. And the success of SAT solvers in math is due probably to a combination of factors uh, there's hardware constantly advancing, so computers are, uh, are faster. There's software advances. People work really hard on making faster and faster SAT solvers. So every year there's a competition uh, for which SAT solver is best and uh, that leads to continuous improvement of the field. Um, we will talk later about the, uh, the very first one, the SBVA, because uh, it's slightly related to my talk. Uh, but there's software advances every year. And finally, the part that I'm personally interested in is uh, that we can continuously try to get better encodings and use automated reasoning techniques, symmetry breaking, and these sort of ideas about the art of encodings. So in my own research, some examples of how I use SAT solvers for other things that are not directly sort of SAT solving problems uh, is I've been using SAT solvers to build gadgets for proving empty hardness of combinatorial problems. Uh, so something I proved uh, recently was the MP hardness of directed feedbacks, feedback vertex set on K out regular graphs without induced uh, C2 subgraphs. And I needed a gadget uh, satisfying a particular set of constraints. I put it into a solver, it spit out a solution for a graph that did exactly what I did. Now, of course, this is not fully automated. You need to uh, think first of what kind of properties would you like in a gadget for your reduction but then this sort of manual search for a concrete example you can automate. Uh, I use gadgets to prove that this packing coloring problem uh, that my talk is about is NP-hard before knowing that people had already proved it, so I found this gadget and this gadget that were used in my proof also through uh, SAT solving. So in a case like this, for example, what I was encoding is I want a graph with at most, let's say, uh, 40 vertices that guarantees that if the uh, left, like the special vertex on the left of the graph, on the graph gets 
a given color, then the special vertex on the other end of the graph gets the same color. So I wanted a graph that without touching anything else, uh, a subgraph that without touching, interfering with anything else in the graph would guarantee this property of two faraway nodes always getting the same uh, color. And you can enforce that by this subgraph. Now, an example I'm quite excited because it's about a problem I want to solve and I haven't solved yet. It's about Rubik's cubes. So a, high, a very important success of computational mathematics uh, about a decade ago was to find out that uh, the Rubik's cube diameter is 20. So if you take an unsolved Rubik's cube like this and a solved Rubik's cube, uh, the number of moves to go from this to this is at most 20 in every configuration. And the graph of the Rubik's cube is massive. So computing its diameter, which is usually an operation that you would do quite efficiently in a small graph, it's really a huge engineering challenge. Now the question I'm interested is actually kind of the opposite. Not how fast can you solve puzzles, but how slowly can you solve a Rubik's cube? So just to be a bit more precise, what I mean is imagine I want to solve this cube and I want to take the maximum number of moves possible, but obviously to not trivialize the problem, I don't want to repeat states. Because otherwise I could just be looping on a move. And this is of course a question about uh, Hamiltonian paths, and in particular, it's very related so, to some deep conjectures by uh, Lovas on the Hamiltonian connectedness of Cayley graphs of uh, groups with finite generators. So uh, this is particularly interesting, interesting for groups that are not abelian, like the Rubik's cube, in which doing R first and then U, it's very different from doing U first and then R. Um, so what people want to understand is that, is it true that in every Cayley graph of such a group, there's a Hamiltonian path between every pair of vertices. That would mean Hamiltonian connectedness. Now, um, there's graphs. Hamiltonian, it means it goes through every vertex. Yes, it, the Hamiltonian path means that it goes through every uh, vertex exactly once. So uh, I'll show this picture and explain it through a table I made here. So just to think about the complexity of this problem, we can think of a one by two by three Rubik's cube. People use the word cube, it's not really a cube, but uh, the idea is a one by two by three puzzle. This is only 48 states. So that's the graph I'm representing here. It's a bipartite graph with 48 states, and you can easily prove with a sat solver in a second that between any red vertex and any blue vertex, there's a Hamiltonian path. The graph is bipartite, bi bipartite so that's the best you can hope for. If you take the one by three by three Rubik's cube that has 192 states, so this cube right here, and the naive encoding is too slow to prove Hamiltonian connectedness of this puzzle, but you can use um, Marian's, my advisor, cool Chinese remainder encoding that he published a few years ago. That's uh, a better way to encode Hamiltonian paths, and then you can solve this problem. But now for the real actual uh, problem, you have a graph that doesn't fit in any computer, right? So uh, that's a challenge, and what it means also is that you will not be able to solve it computationally in a direct fashion, but hopefully by solving smaller puzzles, we can get some intuition of a general proof that could apply. Do you know the answer for two by two by two? Uh, no, I do not know the answer. I know that there is one Hamiltonian path. I do not know if, it, if, if there's Hamiltonian path between every pair of vertices. Also, the, the naive encoding is really simple. You create a variable saying, uh, I want to constructively build my Hamiltonian path. So I'll say a variable xij means that the node i is in position j of the Hamiltonian path. Then I will use these exactly one ideas that I was talking about earlier to encode that each vertex is used exactly once. And then I want to make sure that uh, things are uh, in a path. So if ik is not an edge, then I cannot have uh, vertices i and k be use successive positions of my constructed path. Questions? So that, <clears throat> that's good for the 48 states, probably. Yes, but not for the 192. Not for the, not for the, oh, 192 is, all, is, is already much too hard. Yes, I mean, I think actually you could solve it in a few days so that you might consider that still doable, but if you wanna solve it in less than, let's say 20 seconds, then you need some better encoding. And I really recommend if somebody's interested to check the Chinese reminder encoder of Moran because it's really cool. It uses the multiplicity of different cycles and the Chinese reminder theorem uh, to find out things about Hamiltonian paths. 
Okay, so uh, if there are no questions, I'll get started with uh, the actual core of my talk, uh, the packing chromatic number of the infinite gray. So let's talk first about standard graph coloring. So a definition of standard graph coloring is that you want a function from the set of vertices to the integers from one through k, such that if two vertices receive the same color, then their distance needs to be greater than one. Now I know people have seen other formulations of this, but the one that's useful for this talk is to think about it this way. When I'm giving the same color to two vertices, that imposes the requirement that their distance must be greater than one. So if I take a path on four vertices, I can put a one here, then I cannot put a one again, so I need another color, let's say a two, then it's only fine to put a one again, and then it's only fine to put a two again. Now, uh, let's go to packing colorings, the actual subject of my talk. So it's a really, really small and natural modification of the definition. It's just now that if two vertices receive the same color C, then their distance needs to be greater than C. So this is the way I like to explain the problem, is just making the distance condition a function of the color as opposed to a uniform constant. So if we consider now again the path on four vertices, I'll start with vertex two. The next one I can place is vertex, uh, sorry, I start with vertex one uh, and color one. Next color I can place a two. Now can I place a one there? Yes, I can because it will be a distance two from the other one and two is greater than one, so it's fine. But now can I place a two here? Well, now I cannot and I need to place a three. If I had put a two here, I would have a pair of twos that are a distance two. So that's a contradiction with the problem definition. And obviously, uh, something we can already see is that chromatic numbers get larger in this world, necessarily. So let's start looking at some infinite graphs because that's where this packing chromatic thing gets uh, really interesting. So let's think of the infinite path. So uh, just as before, I'll start with one, two, one, three, and actually I'll realize that I can just keep repeating this pattern. So it's easy to see that the uh, packing chromatic number of the infinite path is three. Now let's think of a slightly more challenging graph. So uh, we can think of this as some sort of infinite ladder. Uh, and if I start placing a one here, now notice that I cannot place a one either directly above or directly to its right. So I'll place it diagonally and it feels like it's a good, a good idea to keep going like this. Now uh, let's say I place a two there because I have to place some, something at least in that position. Now where's the next two I can place? Beautiful. So I can place it there, and I can keep going in that same pattern. That's gonna be totally fine. Then if I place a three, I can also do the same sort of alternating pattern. And now I can put fours on the top row and fives on the bottom one. So what this shows is that the chromatic number of this infinite ladder is at most five. At least I can do it with five. Can I do better? Well, I'll leave you with that in case uh, you want a problem before bed tonight. And, it, and it's funny in cases like this to prove that, it, like, if the answer is actually five, to prove that four doesn't work. So a bit about packing colorings. So they were introduced, as I mentioned earlier, in uh, 2002, and the original name was actually broadcast colorings. And let me go a bit about why they were called that way and what the motivation was. So imagine you have uh, radio antennas, and you want to assign them frequencies to transmit. So if we assign all our radios that are in neighboring areas at uh, the same frequency, let's say 99.4 uh, four megahertz, then we have some interference problem between them. So uh, naturally what I would do is like, okay, then I wanna try uh, different frequencies. So let's say I change that one to 101.7. So now uh, the leftmost two will not have interference, but these two will still have. And now here's, the, here's the, the catch, the cool catch about the problem. Can I change this one to 101.7? Well, there's a bit of an issue here. When you use a higher frequency, uh, that means that your wavelength is lower, Maxwell equation, and those travel farther. So that means that the radius, the geographical radius in which you cannot repeat the same frequency, it's larger. So the frequency of your radio stations determines the radio in which you cannot repeat it in order to avoid interference. And obviously you want to pollute the frequency spectrum as least as possible, so you do want to minimize the number of different frequencies you're using. 
Now, of course, the packing coloring is not a full, complete descriptive model of radio frequency assignments, but it's a sort of conceptual subproblem one is thinking about. So I will use a third different color, and this is my same pattern as before, one, two, one, three. So uh, in 2007, Brescher and others reinterpreted this notion and call it packing colorings. I will not be talking much about the packing interpretation, but you can think of this as a mixture between a coloring and a uh, packing problem. And since then, over 70 papers have studied different aspects of packing colorings, so it's kind of a decently active area of uh, combinatorics. And the latest survey uh, of Brescher and others stated that the most important open problem with respect to infinite graphs was to determine the packing chromatic number of the infinite square grid, so Z2. So let me go through an, ex an amazing example of the kind of interesting math that can appear in, uh, in um, packing chromatic analysis of infinite graphs. So this is Chebyshev's grid. So it's the same as the infinite square grid, but now I have these diagonal edges. Now, let's do the following analysis. Let's parcel this grid out in subsets of four by four, just for the argument of a proof, and let's focus on one of these four by four subsections. Let's try to place number one, or color one, here, and we can see how I can place it at most four times in this grid. This argument, because I can parcel my infinite grid into these uh, chunks of uh, four by four, shows that I cannot hope to cover a fraction of more than a fourth of the graph with color one. This is uh, a so-called density argument. I'm saying that the density of color one in this graph is gonna be at most a quarter. So uh, for the uh, mm, uh, theory inclined, um, you can define density in terms of uh, supremum over all the colorings, supremum over the vertices, you need that because of infinite cardinality, and then a superior limited limit of how many uh, vertex in increasing uh, radius balls around every vertex receive a given color. So this is basically just, in a finite graph, the definition of density is really simple, it's how many vertices get color four out of the total number of, of vertices, and then for infinite graphs, you do standard limiting. So now, uh, why is this cool? Well, let's now look at uh, color number, color three. And color three, we can actually only place one in this four by four grid. Once I place it there, uh, which is at the extreme of the grid, I cannot place it any uh, more times. So color three covers uh, a one over 16 fraction. That's an upper bound on its density. And uh, more in general, color K cannot hope to have density better than one over k plus one square, because on a, uh, on a k plus one times k plus one parcel subgraph, I can only fit one occurrence of it. So that means that with all the colors in the world, I could not ever hope to have more than this fraction. And if I just uh, shift the uh, indexing of my sum, I get this. And of course, this is Euler's Basel uh, sum problem. So I get p squared over six minus one, and this is 0.6, so it's less than one. So I cannot ever hope to color this graph, even if I had access to a limiting countable infinite supply of colors, because I will uh, be limited by the density. And if people are interested in learning more about the relationship between our methods and some ideas about Euler, my advisor and I just wrote an article uh, that's here uh, about um, a proof that, uh, so we believe that Euler could have come up with this proof pretty easily. It's a straightforward application of his own ideas. Uh, but I believe that some mathematical problems as the one I'm gonna keep talking later, the infinite grid without diagonals, requires so much computation that I don't believe there's a short proof. And that's what this article is about. Yes, for that one. For the one with diagonals, there's a short proof. The with the one without diagonals, the shortest proof we have gotten is uh, 34 terabytes. And n naturally, there could be a way smaller proof, <laughs> but, I, but, I, but part of me just believes that that's the number. And there's a similar example with Sudokus, for example. So I talked about a, an encoding for Sudokus earlier. There's a problem that says, or a result that says that the minimum number of clues you need for a Sudoku to have a unique solution is 17 clues. I will, I'm also inclined to believe 
that there's no short proof for that fact. But there's, a, there, there's quite a bit more exposition in the article and I can, uh, yes. Are there any situations where you've actually proved the non-existence of a short proof? Only for very toy examples. Like for example, for like, Yes, yes, for, 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 for any of these sites, I've never seen anything like that. There's like, there's like some known examples where people have been able to do that, but they're like toy examples. It's like, like in particular, it has to do with pigeonhole principle formulas, like formulas that assert that there's no injection uh, from a set of n plus one things to one with n things, yes. So to be clear here, by the length of a proof, you're referring to, for example, you have a set instance and it's unsatisfiable and you're looking at the, the tree that proves the unsatisfiability or something like this? Yes, so, so the size of the proof is something that depends on which proof system you're doing, right? If, I would be totally happy with calling the size of the proof, let's say, uh, I don't know, 20 kilobytes if somebody sends me an email in ASCII text that contains a proof that I'm happy with. Cause, cause, and it's ha hard to compare, right? But I would be happy with that. Uh, now, of course, these proofs are, are fully computational, so, it's, so you generate a file and then you look at uh, what its weight is after compression, but yeah, it, there, there's not like, unfortunately, I guess, like, a, like a, an all-encompassing proof size definition, because it will depend on how your proof looks like. So does it also mean there's no human readable proof? Uh, I mean, obviously, I, uh, as uh, you were asking, I have no proof of that fact, but that's my belief. And I don't know, a, a more interesting example about that is like the four color theorem, where people are still trying really hard to get a human readable proof. Yeah, that's it. That literally just carries like this much paper to them. I think I check every line <laughs> for like a thousand percent. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. yeah so, so just going back to the original, to the to the diagonal one. Yes. You proved that it's impossible. Yes. To, but there's no finite set of right range of colors right such that you can color it right consistent with satisfying the rules. Yes. But that's not true of the square grid. Right? You can do it. Yes, for the square grid, you can but do it. That, but that's been known. Like you said, it was known up to 15 or something. Yes, known yes. 15 were doable. Yes, that, 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 is, that is known. And actually, uh, if we go back to saying, okay, what happens if we try to do the same analysis on the square one? The thing that happens is that now you have quite more freedom to place things around. So in this four by four thing, and I can actually place three occurrences of number three. And because of that, my bounds and density are way worse. If I take this infinite sum, then I will get that this converges to something above 1.9, so it's greater than one, so in principle, everything is fine. And indeed, as you're saying, you can do it with an infinite, uh, with, with a finite number of colors, yes. But this already gives us some bound on like, the, for example, the number of ones that have to appear. Yes, that's a, that, yeah, that is a good question, or, or a good point, uh, yes. And, and you can do things based on that, so actually, ju just, uh, this is actually how people first approach the problem and how also I approach it for some paper without much success. So you can, um, you can look more carefully. So these bounds based on K I was giving for densities are sort of asymptotically true, but for particular numbers, you can do better by just like looking at things with a microscope. So for example, it's pretty easy to see that for color one, you can only hope to get a half density. Exactly, that, yeah, that, that's a way of proving a lower bound, exactly. So uh, it's easy to, for example, just by hand, uh, find these bounds on densities, and then with these bounds, uh, because the sum of these terms is less than one, uh, that will be proving that you need at least six colors. Now with a much more uh, sophisticated version of this, uh, Fiat and others in 2009 proved that you need at least 10 colors. So that's how they got that lower bound. Yes, yes, better like also considerations of joint densities. So yeah. what's the best I could achieve if I, have, if I consider two, three, and seven at the same time, for example? So for the other direction to construct it, you could set up a periodic tiling, right? So, so that would be a way of doing it. Yes, that might be a way. I, I, actually, that's still open, and I can talk about that in a second. Um, so uh, what, is the, what is the right answer? What, how many colors do you need to do this? Well, the answer is, as already spoiled, 15. And in the time I've left, I'll show basically how we use the solvers. I'll skip the question uh, remark because uh, we have been going through questions. I guess, uh, Danny, this can be maybe the title of my talk. Um, <laughs> okay. 
So let me go a bit through the historical progress. So in 2002, the seminal paper proved that the answer was between 9 and uh, 20, 23. Then the bound was improved to, the upper bound was improved to 22. Uh, those bounds, by the way, were just by finding colors uh, explicitly. And the paper does not say anything about how they got there. It has a matrix. Uh, and it says, like, copy this periodically, and you'll get uh, a coloring. Um, then, as I mentioned, in 2009, people improved the upper bound with better density arguments. Then in 2010, through compu computation, that was a great year for the problem, progress on both sides. And then subsolvers came into the picture in 2015. And then the answer was uh, between 13 and 17, I think. Yeah, then, uh, or 16, sorry, then improvement to 13 and 15. That's basically what we were able to get in our first year. Then in 2022, uh, we proved that uh, um, 13 was not the answer, and then finally uh, we concluded the search in 2023. And uh, something I want to remark is that since 2015 onwards, all the progress on the problem was done through SAT solvers. So how can we use uh, computers to prove bounds on infinite graphs, a priori they're infinite objects? So there are two directions, there's upper and uh, lower bounds and upper bounds. So for lower bounds, what we want is to find an appropriate finite, finite subgraph and then prove that that subgraph cannot be colored with k colors. That will give us a lower bound on the infinite graph. Does that compute? Uh, yes, by compactness of first order logic. So, uh, <laughs> it, it, so, so uh, there's a version that's called Erdos de Brun, and but it, it is true that in first order logic, uh, you ha yeah, the, the, if you look, if you look it up, I think it should be it should be clear. But you cannot have like your first exception to a first order logical formula be a countable like an inf like a countably infinite model. So if things work f uh, for countably infinite, then they work for uh, all the um, for all the finite uh, subsets of the structure. So that's very general. It applies to colorings. It applies to many problems of this kind. Um, And, 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 and so also, just to be clear, that's for countable. It, it, that's not true for uncountable things. Uh, so for upper bounds, how do, you find, uh, how do you find that it's possible to use k colors? Well, it depends on whether the coloring you will get is aperiodic or periodic. If it's aperiodic, uh, partially answering Denny's question, the answer is that we don't know. So I proved, but it's actually very simple, that if you think of one-dimensional graphs, uh, so like the infinite path, for example, or the infinite ladder, then whenever there exists a coloring, uh, there also exists a periodic coloring. But that might not be the case for the infinite uh, square grid. And in fact, it's well known that there are uh, examples uh, of similar problems where that fails to hold, like Wong tiles, for example. As soon as you have two-dimensionality, there's a risk of uncomputability and therefore like inherent aperiodicity and so on. Uh, but for periodic graphs, we can do something with the computer. So this idea is that we will use something that I like to call toroidal edges to encode periodicity. So we'll take our finite subgraph and add some wraparound edges sort of encoding directly the fact that we will uh, want to color the infinite graph by periodically repeating this structure. So I'll show an example. So uh, to get a computational proof of the coloring number of the path being three, uh, first you ask a computer to try to do it with two colors and it will say, okay, let me place a one, let me place a two, let me place a one there and then I cannot do it. Uh, so it's so uh, just by checking that uh, two colors don't work, you get lower bound. Now for getting the upper bound, we will uh, create this toroidal edge, and notice that this is still a valid uh, packing coloring of this graph with the toroidal edge. And it's not hard to see that that implies that when I sort of unfold it once, I can obviously keep placing the one, two, one, three, but the fact that this three was a distance one of this vertex here before means that I'm totally allowed to place a one here that's a distance one of that three. So actually I'll be able to keep going and by repeatedly unfolding this I get the infinite path. And completeness of this approach also falls, follows by compactness. Um, so that's how you prove upper bounds. Now uh, I said, Is multiple of true periods. Right? Yes. Yes. Well, yeah, or at least it's greater or equal than a true period, because there's not necessarily one true period. It could be that there were solutions uh, with a larger, with diff but yeah. 
But yes, I, I, I agree that there's some periodicity involved. In fact, I'm trying to prove now, there's a deep result in number theory that says that if you have a sequence of arithmetic progressions with distinct moduli, they cannot cover the integers unless some of the, uh, some of the like one of the steps of the arithmetic progressions is smaller than some finite amount. So I'm trying to use that to prove uh, that there are cases where, you, in, where your sum of densities diverge and yet you don't have a packing coloring because the truncated sum of densities for the one dimensional path always diverge is the sum of one over k plus one. So even if you start from with your lowest color being 10 to the 18th, it should diverge in density. Okay, so uh, it's key for this problem to find the appropriate subgraphs to prove lower bounds. So Eckstein et al. in their bound uh, use the nine uh, by 15 grid, then Martin and others use the 14 by 14 grid, and already a change of our approach is that we consider these called diamond graphs, which are a more, much more natural choice mathematically because they correspond to bolts in the corresponding metric. And from now on, I'll represent graphs in this sort of grid fashion as opposed to nodes connected by edges just because it's more comfy for the problem. So the first idea that's key for solving this problem, it's uh, translational symmetry. So it turns out that in this problem, when you're trying to color a finite subgraph, you can assume with loss, without loss of generality, the color of uh, some vertex. So in, their origin, in this original work, they forced some vertex to get color nine. In our work, we forced the central vertex to get color six. And that's a good idea to do at the center because it's the one that participates in the most number of classes. So why is this uh, true without loss of generality? The idea is as follows. So assume first that there's no solution with 13 colors. That's what we proved in 2022. So now if there were a solution with colors one through 14 but avoiding six, we could actually map it, map it to a solution using colors one through 13. And the idea is simply that I could take any color that's greater than six, move it one down, and because smaller colors uh, create weaker restrictions, that would be uh, still fine. So therefore, if there exists a solution, it must use color six. And here's where the translational symmetry part comes. Why can I assume that it's in the center? Well, it's because if there's a six somewhere in my infinite graph, I can always imagine that the graph I'm trying to color is a subgraph that's centered exactly there. And it turns out that six in the center is the best color to force. We just know this basically experimentally. I have some ideas of why this is the case, but I could not prove uh, any results about it. Um, so the direct encoding for this problem is to just use variables that represent that a vertex takes a given color. Uh, we want to enforce that every vertex gets some color. So that you get R square, uh, many clauses if you're trying to color a diamond of radius R. And then the at most one distance clauses, these are the ones that are most important for the problem. So for any pair of vertices, whose distance is at most C, they cannot both simultaneously receive color C. And this, uh, if you do the calculation, uh, you get that it's R square uh, K cubed, many clauses, and finally, a single little cute clause uh, saying that the color in the center is whatever you chose it to be. So R is the size of the box that you would Yes, on? yes, exactly. So, uh, so this direct encoding uses uh, so many variables and so many clauses, and for uh, proving a lower bound of 15, you will, need, you will need at the very least R and K to be 14, and that results in a million clauses already. So that's sort of beyond the pay grade of a modern SAT <coughs> solver in this kind of problem. And the bottleneck is of course in the clauses about the distance restriction. So we propose in our SAT 2022 paper a recursive encoding that has only R squared K log K many clauses but unfortunately, it's basically something that only works in theory because the constant factor is so large that in practice turns out to be even worse than the naive encoding. But because we knew that in theory something better was possible, we were searching for how could you make it better in practice. So uh, the main piece of our work is a practical encoding that we call the PLAS encoding. So there's a tool called BVA, bounded variable addition, that takes a Boolean formula and tries to automatically through greedy heuristics to make it smaller, to re-encode things to make it smaller. So we, we try to reverse engineer this tool. And the issue is that even though it substantially reduced the number of clauses, the runtimes 
same as with the theoretical recursive construction, did not get better. So by reverse engineering the tool, we were able, after a lot of work, to understand basically what the heuristics were catching on, and it was basically the following idea. So the heuristics of BVA were thinking of some regions in the graph, some connected regions in the graph, that we call regional classes, where it was introducing an auxiliary variable, let's say Y1, saying that at least one of the vertices in the red uh, area gets color four, and let's say another uh, regional variable and class, Y2, that says that at least one of the vertices in the blue region gets color four. So why would this help in any, in any way? Well, this, I, the idea is pretty cool, is simply now that now, because you have these Y1 and Y2 variables, now you can simply say that it cannot be the case that Y1 and Y2 are simultaneously true. Because every pair of, of every, every red vertex, blue vert, vertex uh, pair of vertices are a distance uh, less or equal than four, if you have a vertex with color four in the blue region, you cannot have one in the red region and vice versa. So instead of encoding all pairs, you first introduce these variables and then introduce this Y1, Y2 clause. The problem with why that wasn't working well in practice is that BVA, uh, because of its greedy nature, was introducing different shapes of regions and of different uh, sizes and place them, placing them kind of awkwardly in the graph. Where did the BVA come from? Did you guys discover the BVA? No, no, no. That, that's, that may, so that's a tool from, I think, 2011. Uh, yeah. Just for the. In general, takes. No, 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 no. It's very general. It takes. Strategy. Is that what it is? Yes, it's a preprocessing tool that takes a Boolean formula and tries to make it smaller. In a wide variety of the cases, it will give you back the same formula and say, like, I couldn't do anything. Uh, but sometimes it identifies a way of shortening your encoding by introducing variables or, or, or doing uh, some fancy techniques. And it gives you something smaller. So in You're saying off the shelf, it just wasn't helping you solve your problem? No, it was, it was reducing the number of clauses, but making the runtime worse. So we were trying to understand how could this tool be reducing the number of clauses? Where, where is that we're missing some potential efficiency in our encoding? So by reverse engineering, we realized this idea of the regional clauses, and the plus encoding is basically taking the same idea, but do it in a structured, symmetrical manner where the placing is optimal with respect to some uh, metric I will not be. Uh, talking about, so we call this the plus encoding because it turns out the best shape is to use this plus symbol. So here's a table of comparison of how things worked. So in the direct encoding, uh, the number of classes is maximized, it's like 21,000. With VVA, you get down to 3,000 classes. With the plus encoding, because it's not using greedy heuristics trying to only minimize the number of classes, but some more interesting metric, you get more classes, but the runtime is way, way better. And this is only a, only a small example. The difference gets actually larger the larger uh, the examples you make. So also for context, proving this lower bound of, uh, of 12 took uh, 120 days of computation when people first did it. Now with the plus encoding, you can do it in uh, a bit over 10 minutes. And with the techniques I'm gonna show in the next, I think, three minutes, um, you can do it in under a second. So uh, just a comment on this idea of creating more structured ideas. So actually based on that, a couple of Carnegie Mellon students developed a technique called SBVA that stands for Structure Variable uh, Bounded Variable Addition, trying to add this idea of how to make things more regular in bounded variable addition. And with that, they were able to, uh, just adding that as a pre-processing step to the top solver of the previous year, they were the top solver of 2023. So, uh, for symmetry breaking, uh, the idea is to reduce the space of solutions using symmetries of the problem. So in our case, these diamonds have a natural eighth-fold symmetry according to three different axes. Um, so you can hope to get uh, an improvement in runtime uh, by a factor of eight. Uh, so the way to encode this uh, can be illustrated with the following example. If you consider a subgraph of your diamond that's a diamond of radius five, then because of the restrictions of the problem, there can be at most one occurrence of color 10 in it. Otherwise, that would be a conflict. Because there can be at most one occurrence of color 10, you can force that if color 10 appears in that subgraph, then it must do so in the north-northeast uh, region. 
So you're forcing it to appear in part of the graph as opposed to its symmetric copy here or here or there. And you simply do that by forbidding with unit clauses uh, for it to occur in the purple region. Now, of course, color 10 might not necessarily appear. So uh, actually, in practice, we do a refinement of this approach where if color 10 doesn't appear, then you can break symmetries on color uh, 9 and so on. I'm not going to get into the details, but that's the main principle of symmetry breaking. Yes? Haven't you already broken the symmetry by introducing the sixth symmetry? Uh, I've broken only one symmetry, but know that all the symmetries of reflection and stuff like that preserve the number in the middle. No, no, but ima imagine you have a six in the, s so I guess what I'm saying is the following, is imagine you have six in the middle and three, it's, it, it's adjacent to the left, that's symmetric to this case, and they both have six in the middle. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you can exploit all the symmetries that way. Um, next thing is uh, cube and conquer, which is uh, what we do for parallelism. So this is uh, a very cool idea by my advisor on how to use uh, parallelism in set solving. So uh, the main idea is that you will take your CNF formula phi uh, and consider a tautological DNF. And what you will say is that the satisfiability of the original formula is equivalent to the uh, conjunction with the tautology. And by distributing that, you get that your original, your original formula is satisfiable if and only if it satis the formula is satisfiable in conjunction with one of the cases of the DNF. So the key idea here is that each of those cases we will solve in parallel. And uh, the intuition is that the DNF being a tautology means that you're making an, ex an exhaustive split of your uh, search space into, um, into cases. So you're basically trying for each of the possible cases there are an exhaustive split whether your formula in that case can be satisfied or not. This is even what you were doing before, right? When you said something has to be in the middle, then split all the cases for what's in the middle, and one of them turns out to be the easiest to solve. Yes. But, but, in, but in that case, it's even better because we can, we, we, it's enough to solve it only with six. In this case, you do need to solve each case separately. But yes, you're, you're right. That, um, so uh, there's an art to design a good cube and conquer split. If you make too few cases, then you're wasting the power of parallelism. If you make too many, then you waste the power of the underlying set solving algorithms. Uh, the extremal example, let's make two to the n cases, where each case is one variable assignment. And it's very important that the cases are similar in difficulty, otherwise you're also wasting parallel computation. So in our previous work, our split was directly over uh, the variables of the problem, the x variables. Something that uh, makes our solution much better is that in, in this case, we do the split over the auxiliary variables of the plus encoding, so over the regions. And let me explain very briefly why that's better. So in the old split, we were splitting on a case regarding something like whether vertex 4, 3 gets color 5. Now, in the case where that's positive, that's really good. You know the color of a vertex. In the case where that's negative, it's actually kind of bad. You only know that that vertex doesn't get color five. That's not a lot of information. In the new split, we're checking, we're splitting on whether some vertex in that region gets color seven. So if some vertex in that region gets color seven, you get some amount of information, not as precise as which specific vertex, but now if that's negative, you also get a decent amount of information because now you know that in an entire region, color seven is not there. And as I was saying earlier, in parallelism, the more balanced you are, the better. So this is key for our approach. And with this, we get basically linear speed ups. So with 128 cores, we go down to 6.6 .6 seconds. Uh, so 123 factor of improvement, roughly as good as you could get. Now, uh, in order of time, I'll uh, skip some things. Um, the final proof, uh, we do it with the D15 graph, color six in the center, the plus encoding, five layers of symmetry breaking, uh, five million cubes uh, designed by a concrete algorithm uh, to construct them, some clauses that are not super important because they only get a 5% benefit, and we get an unsolved, unsat result after roughly 5,000 CPU hours. Uh, the DRAD proof, or the, the proof you get, it's 34 terabytes compressed from 122. And uh, to make sure that there were no like bugs in our code or everything that's correct, we go through uh, a great length of uh, issues in terms of formal verification that are kind of outside of uh, 
my talk. So I think now I'm basically ready. I'll say one thing, uh, and then I'll leave you guys. So uh, something cool that happened throughout this work is that Donald Knuth uh, is very interested in this combination of sat solving and graph coloring. And he received a copy of our paper, uh, gave us back many comments. And one of the things he said is that the plus encoding figure uh, reminded him of a church in Norway that he visited with his wife uh, like 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And my advice from Ryan contacted the church online, asked them for a picture, and we got this. And you can see the little pluses in the background. So we sent all of the picture back, and he sent like a one-line email saying that the internet is wonderful. Um, <laughs> an interesting thing that's the cover of this magazine is what we call the chessboard conjecture. And I think uh, somebody here asked a question about this earlier, about the, how many times we have to use color one. So we had the conjecture that you could assume without loss of generality, color one to be put in the chessboard pattern. Uh, I was trying really hard to prove that manually by some mathematical argument, because if that's true, then the problem gets much easier. You basically get rid of half of the vertices, which uh, in an exponential time problem, it's really massive. So it was really easy to, uh, for a radius of 14, by enforcing the chessboard idea to get unsatisfiability. It turns out that once we improved our approach so much to be able to fully solve the problem, uh, we realized that the conjecture is wrong and we found uh, the minimal counterexample, which is uh, that if you do the same D14 uh, without the chessboard, there is actually a solution you can find. And let me uh, remove all the colors to avoid distractions. There's these two little guys that deviate from the pattern and they turn out to be key uh, for solving this instance. You cannot have one single occurrence that deviates and if you assume that no one deviates, then the formula is unsat. So we like that counterexample uh, so much that we made a little R piece based on it that now I have in my room. And then some final words on the upper bound. So people prove kind of manually uh, that 15 was possible. Uh, with our techniques, it's really easy to do it with a toroidal 72 by 72 grid and a local search solver. So a solver that just uses randomness to jump into better and better assignments. Um, Open question, can you do it with smaller? Uh, and to show how this looks like, I'll conclude with an animation uh, that uh, David Sackley from Hungary did um, about, this is the, the periodic uh, 15 color one that we found. And something I really like about this particular animation is that it reminds me a bit of the uh, radio towers of the original 2002 uh, motivation. Well, I, I tried our numbers as well, but yeah, I think that's key for, for this, that it, it's highly composite, yeah. So, for example, I don't know if 48, but 48 could work. It's currently too hard to solve, um, but I would be curious, yeah. I, I'd be extremely surprised if 71 by 71, for example, could work. <laughs> so why is 48 harder to solve if it's fewer, if it's smaller? Uh, because you're trying to, to obtain a solution. So with, with 72, you're giving it more slack in some sense, yes. So it's like the, the formula is for sure smaller, but how hard it is to find the assignment is harder. It's like a cube of four parts. Uh, yes, they are four apart, yes. Now, they, they could be three, but you couldn't do that without sacrificing density for other colors. So it turns out that, um, so two, two appear with the density of one eight here, or one eight, which is not their optimal density on their own. Uh, yes. Did you try uh, uh, using a chessboard and turning it on its side? So instead of using one diamond and continuing it periodically, maybe trying two diamonds continued in a red blue pattern. Could that possibly give you? Could you have like two diamonds which are substantially smaller that yield some kind of quasi periodic pattern? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think the answer is probably yes, but I haven't been able to do anything like that. So I, I, I'm guessing that your question has a bit to do with, I'm assuming here that my sort of base periodic unit will be a square thing. It could be something else, right? It could be a more complicated graph or it could be that the periodicity is not as direct as like simply take this thing, put it side to side or yes. And I, and I think that's possible. Actually, we have in our SAT paper a, a, a cool idea of that form for how you can prove with set solvers that the 
uh, packing chromatic number of the infinite binary tree is seven. And then the way of, of encoding periodicity, it's more interesting. Because it needs to be sort of a tree where the leaves sort of connect to another copy of the tree and so on. I can show you at some point. Ref you can have a smaller unit, but you can use reflecting control. Yes, yes, and, the, and, and I think those things could work. Then the issue is how do you encode, like, because then your, your idea of periodicity starts getting more complicated, and you have to put it in the encoding at some point. Right. Also, what if I change the norm to the Elko norm, which is the natural norm in the radio uh, frequency? Uh, that's a good question. So you're saying, so just to be clear, you're saying, the points are like integers and you're considering the L2 distance. Yes. Um, I'll take the floor or the field. Yeah, I'll, I'll get back to you because uh, it's interesting and I don't know the answer. I, I, I do know the answer for other metrics or for other graphs, but for that one I actually... Have you found any other coloring besides this one? Uh, yes, but not with very interesting differences, if that makes sense. Uh, like, for example, the roles of two and twos and threes can be interchanged here, or there's a couple. For example, the symmetry breaking, uh, if you disallow it, you will get the symmetric solutions. So I haven't found a solu solutions that, you'd, that I would consider like sort of substantially different, which I don't quite know how to define. Um, not, so in the way you're formulating, I don't know the answer. I do know that in, the, in all the placements we, we have found, there are colors, and actually most of them, uh, that are not using their optimal uh, density, but I'm not sure if there's one with none of them. Mm, not necessarily, or, or I guess, so, so you're saying that for each color it happens that all its occurrence, like for each color C it happens that all its occurrences are distance greater than um, C plus one from it? Because if that's the case then yes, then you can subtract one from everything. Uh, but yeah, we, we can discuss more of the detail offline. Can I, I make a remark? Yes. A okay, first of all, remark, do you see how many questions there are? You see how people, are, their brains are popping with different ideas, right? So without that, right, a person, a mathematician would be prohibited from exploring all those myriad of beautiful creative questions because they're not a good programmer, right? They have to write all this boutique C code. They have to, you know, know all this fancy CS. But now with SAT, you know, even this humble mathematician who writes in Fortran, right, can, <laughs> can get under the hood of SAT. And SAT is so nimble that it allows for exploration of cases and generalizations which will point us to a greater understanding of the mathematics underlying things. That's why it's deep, in my opinion, for mathematics. I agree, John, thank you. <laughs> yes? In the, um, the, the radio broadcasting example that you were giving, I would imagine that you don't get all the way down to the equivalent of one. Like, if you were to, repre if you were to faithfully represent this like radio broadcasting thing yes. as, as a problem of this form, you would have like numbers like, the minimum number that you could use would be like 90 or something. Right, and yes. The numbers with 90, 91, 92, 93, 94. Yeah, you're like, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm assuming it, for this graph, for example, if you disallow one, it's probably impossible. That is that. true, yes, okay. that is true. If you okay. disallow one, it's, it, it is impossible, yeah. Um, right, but you can ask questions of that form and they become something that's called S-colorings, like a more general notion where you could imagine that I allow you to use colors one up to 15, except that I forbid you from using 14, but I also will give you in exchange 18, 19, and 20. And my question is, can you still do it, for example? Yeah. So you can think of, 